Happy Monday, listeners. This is Rachel Feltman, and you're listening to Scientific American's Science Quickly. Let's kick off the week by catching up on the latest science news. First, let's check in on a couple of stories we've been following recently. A few weeks ago, Siam's own Allison Partial joined us to explain how and why Paris was trying to make the Seine clean enough for Olympians to swim in. Now, the river did indeed host individual triathlon swimmers for their event on July 31st, but since then there's been a lot of trash talk about the river's bacteria levels. On August 4th, Belgium's Olympic Committee actually said it was pulling its team from the mixed relay triathlon because one of its swimmers had gotten sick after competing in the Seine. Now, Belgium's athlete Claire Mikel did indeed get quite ill with gastrointestinal symptoms, but she clarified on Instagram last week that she was sick with a virus, not an E. coli infection, as many folks had speculated. As Allison explained for us on the pod a few weeks ago, the safety of the Seine changes from day to day. So it's not really a question of whether or not the Seine might be dangerous to swim in. It's a question of what days the Seine is too dangerous to swim in and what days it's safe enough to swim in. And this is something that the Olympic Committee has been very upfront about. Last week, swimmers actually had to skip a planned practice day because of high bacterial counts. They did get cleared to swim the following day, but some swimmers actually used paddle boards so that they could get a feel for the course without putting their heads under the water. They just said it wasn't worth the risk if it wasn't really competition day. To learn more about this massive ecological undertaking and why Paris put such a big, seemingly risky bet on an urban river in the first place, check out our episode from July 19th. And speaking of headlines from the Olympics, if you haven't listened to our July 31st interview with journalist Rose Eveleth, you definitely should. It's got loads of historical context and modern research to help you understand the recent controversies around sex testing and fairness in women's boxing. Seriously, this stuff is wild, and it's more important than ever that you have the facts behind these really worrying controversies. And before we get to some fresh news, here's one more update on an old favorite. Butch Wilmore and Sony Williams are still... Definitely not stuck in space, according to NASA, but also definitely not home yet. And apparently, they might not make it home until 2025. To refresh your memory, these two astronauts got to the International Space Station on June 6th, and they were only meant to stay for like eight days. Issues with the Boeing Starliner craft they rode up on have delayed their return. NASA's been very careful not to imply that the Starliner is unsafe for them to ride on. They've been focused on the fact that parts of Starliner will get jettisoned and burned up the atmosphere, and that means NASA won't be able to study them anymore. So now is the time to hunker down and really focus on all of the little issues that Starliner faced on its way up. But it's starting to look like NASA might be, shall we say, soft launching the idea that Butchinsuni won't be getting back in that vessel. Last week, NASA announced that it wouldn't be sending another crewed mission to the ISS until at least September 24th. And this is a big deal. So the SpaceX Crew-9 mission, which was meant to take four astronauts up to the ISS this coming weekend, can't actually take off until the Starliner spacecraft heads home. That's because the U.S. side of the ISS only has two docks, and SpaceX's Crew Dragon Endeavor is already taking up the second parking space. So that was a pretty good indication that NASA was still feeling iffy on whether or not Butch and Suni could ride home on Starliner anytime soon. In a press conference on Wednesday, NASA stressed that no decisions had been made, which, yeah, I think we can all see that, NASA. But they did note that one potential backup plan for Butch and Suni would be to send them home with the members of the now-delayed Crew-9 mission. The thing is that that mission is supposed to last for six months, which means Butch and Suni wouldn't return until 2025. It seems like NASA is aiming to make a final call about this in the next couple of weeks, so we'll definitely keep you posted. Back on Earth, for the first time in almost 40 years, the Environmental Protection Agency has exercised its authority to immediately pull a pesticide from circulation. Last week, the EPA issued an emergency order suspending the sale of products that contain DCPA, which is also marketed under the name Daxel. The weed killer has been around since the 1950s, and the EPA has been investigating its impact on thyroid health for years. 
The EPA said in a statement that the AMVAC Chemical Corporation, which is the sole manufacturer of DCPA, has repeatedly failed to deliver data that proves the pesticide's safety. And the EPA's assessment suggests that there's unacceptable risk. The weed killer is especially harmful to fetal development, and it's been banned in the European Union for more than a decade. In other, is it just me or is there no such thing as healthy consumption under capitalism news? A study from the Cleveland Clinic suggests that the popular artificial sweetener erythritol could increase the risk of cardiovascular problems, including heart attacks and strokes. Erythritol is found naturally in some fruits and veggies, and our bodies actually produce a little bit of it when we metabolize glucose. But that doesn't mean the quantities found in sugar-free foods and beverages are harmless. In a study published last Thursday, researchers had subjects consume amounts of the compound that were comparable to what you'd find in food products. They tested their blood for the compound and found that their levels increased by more than 1,000 times over baseline. The researchers also saw an increase in blood clot formation, which didn't happen when subjects ate glucose, aka sugar, instead. The same group from Cleveland Clinic recently raised similar concerns about another sugar alcohol called xylitol. The senior author of both studies noted that it might actually be healthier for folks to just enjoy sugar-sweetened treats in moderation than it is to consume lots of sugar alcohols, especially if they're already at risk of or diagnosed with heart or metabolic disease. Let's wrap up with some very fun, albeit highly controversial news that's probably going to lead to one of those terrible alien history TV documentaries. A private research institute called Paleotechnic is arguing that ancient Egyptians may have used a surprising tool to help build the pyramids, hydraulic lifts. A new paper from researchers at the company argues that a 4,700-year-old pyramid was constructed with the help of a sophisticated hydraulic freight elevator powered by a branch of the Nile. But it seems like this admittedly very jazzy headline is pretty problematic. Outside experts noted that there were no Egyptologists or archaeologists involved directly with the study, and folks in those fields seem skeptical, to say the least. They pointed out that there would probably be some historical record of such an impressive device, and that it would be kind of a stretch for the Nile to actually provide the water power needed to fire up such a massive lift. Which is tough, but fair. That's all for this week's News Roundup. Tune in on Wednesday for a deeper dive into the latest science news. And you definitely don't want to miss Friday's episode. I'll be chatting with Wendy Zuckerman of Science Versus to hear all about her efforts to investigate one of science's biggest research taboos. Butt stuff. If you're enjoying the show, do us a favor and leave a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also send us questions, comments, and suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover at sciencequickly at siam.com. Science Quickly is produced by me, Rachel Feltman, along with Fonda Mwangi, Kelso Harper, Madison Goldberg, and Jeff Delvisio. Shana Posis and Aaron Shattuck fact-check our show. Our theme music was composed by Dominic Smith. Subscribe to Scientific American for more up-to-date and in-depth science news. For Scientific American, this is Rachel Feltman. Have a great week.